faces. That was so beautiful. And welcome online. I can't see your faces, but um, it's so good to see you guys. It's good to be back. This is my church family. We love you guys. Woo! Let's go. All right, let's read some scriptures together. We're going to do 2 Corinthians 3.17. Let's hear it. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. John 8, 36. So, so if, if the, the Son sets, sets you free, you, you will be free indeed. And Ephesians 3, 12. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I don't know about you guys, but I love singing about the freedom I have in Jesus and how good he is. So let's continue to sing. Oh, yeah. Be 
before there was time Walked across the pages of time He who made every living thing Behold Him He who heard humanity's cry Left His throne to wake as a child he became like the least of us behold him jesus son of god messiah the lamb the roaring lion oh be still and behold him and saints heal the blind the lost and the lame even now he is in our midst behold him he who chose a criminal's end paid with blood to settle our salvation and for your love God you are so good to us you are the Messiah and we praise you I just pray over the service Lord that you just continue to be honored and glorified and that we would learn about you and our hearts would be changed and that you would expand our understanding of who you are and we would fall more in love with you 
we would understand the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus through our faith in him. We just thank you, Lord God, for all of your blessings, all of your goodness. Just thank you for this day and this church family, Lord God. You are so faithful to us. And in Jesus' name, we all say, Amen. Amen. All right, say hi to the people around you. You know you love them. Good morning, Compass. Can you guys hear me? Can you hear me? Hello? Good morning, Compass. There we are. All right. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Everybody doing good? I'm happy to see everybody. We, we uh, really are grateful for all you guys. Uh, you're really our church family and um, happy to be here and happy to see everybody. Um, so yeah, welcome uh, to your rainy summer Sunday, of course, what we were all expecting in August. Um, uh, first of all, uh, we're doing communion today, so I want to call up the ushers. We're going to take the uh, tithes and offerings um, before we start, so you guys, okay, they're going to run around while we do the announcements today. Um, so yeah, first of all, um, just want to give you the weekly plug for connection cards and, and the app, the Compass app. These, kinda, these two things are kind of sort of the same thing. They kind of have the same purpose. But if you want to get connected here, um, you want to get in touch with the pastors, uh, find out what in the world they're you know, pre preaching and believing. If you just want to get connected with the ministry here, ministries that are going on, or if you have prayer requests or praises, you, know, um, you can use the app or the Compass cards, or, excuse me, connection cards uh, that you find on your seat for that. Um, secondly, we've got uh, Pastor Kelly coming up. He's got a couple of uh, announcements for baptism and another Compass U class. So give him a hand. So first of all, uh, next Sunday, if you come here, remember the rapture hasn't happened. And uh, you basically uh, just don't know where we're at. We're going to be out at the Cadwell's home. And it's our baptismal service and our outdoor service. And so it's, uh, the address is there, uh, 19330. And uh, you can find out how to get there. And if you've never been baptized or were baptized as a child and realized you want to get baptized again uh, or whatever, uh, we'd love to uh, have you join us next week. And so if you'd like to get baptized on our connection card, you can just write down your name and that you want to get baptized or you can contact any of the church staff or contact us this week and let us know. But if God's leading you to do that and you want to take a public stand and say, yeah, I know Jesus and I want people to know, then we'd love to have you uh, get baptized next week. And then on Monday, August 21st, I'm doing a Compass U class called Prophecy for Dummies. And so since we're all dummies in a lot of ways, I wanted to clarify that. 
And, uh, but we'd love to have you come. And a lot of things we're going to do in this. Uh, a lot of times you can read books. I was just looking over the book. Remember the book, The Blood Moons? Remember that? It came out 2015. It was a big seller. And, and it was all about, you know, all these blood moons lining up all in one year. And all this prophecy was going to take place. And that was uh, almost eight years ago. And it didn't happen. And so that's pretty common today. People, you know, get something, a thought or an idea in their mind, and they have all these specific events, and they think this is going to be the end of the world and all these kind of things. And what I think is more important than trying to figure all that out is to know kind of what is the outline of prophecy, what are the events that the Bible clearly says are going to take place, and to define words that people throw out all over the place, but do they really know what they mean? For example, um, what is the difference between the rapture and the second coming? There's a lot of people who think it's the same event, but it's not. They're two separate events. I had a friend, his, his pastor at his church. One of them believed in like post-trib. One believed in pre-trib. And his pastor preached a sermon on the rapture. And they both called me independently of each other and said, my pastor agrees with me. I go, that guy's great. He's a genius. If he can speak on that and everybody thinks that he agrees with them. But there's a difference between the rapture and the second coming. The rapture, we meet Jesus where? In the air. And the second coming, he comes to earth. And they're two separate events. And so there's things like that, that we think we know or we assume we know or we believe this or that. And we just want to clarify those things so that you would, at least when you read about these things, can be able to put them in the right spot and understand why do we believe this or that or whatever. And so that's what the class is all about. I'd love to have you come. You can sign up in the back. It's free. And it uh, starts at 630 on Monday night, the uh, 21st. So that being said, back to uh, our resident drummer, yeah. elder and engineer. Can you believe that? <laughs> Unbelievable. Right. Hey, uh, could I have that announcement? You took my announcement. I don't, I don't remember these things. I have to read them, so. Okay, thanks, Kelly. Yeah, uh, those classes are really great. If you guys haven't been to one of them, um, I'd really recommend it. Every time I go, I learn something. I, th I go in thinking, ah, I know everything about this, and then I always, you know, get corrected or, you know, learn. Uh, anyways. Uh, okay, we got uh, a couple of women's announcements. Um, my lovely wife, uh, Jan Colley, is going to come up and talk to us about women's ministry and also a women's Bible study fellowship. Hey, you said my name right. That was awesome. Okay. All right. So the first announcement is Food Truck Friday, which should pop up in a minute. Um, this is the third one. It's August 18th at 530 and it's at On Tap, so that's the one off Neff, on Crushing, Cushing, not Crushing, Cushing. Um, so go to this and invite somebody. Invite somebody from church, because we see each other at church and we get a chat for a minute, but it's so much, it's so much more fruitful when you can sit down with someone and have a real conversation over really yummy food. So go, it's fun. Um, and then the next announcement I have is Bible Study Fellowship. I am so excited about this, you guys. Our church is going to host Bible Study Fellowship. It is a verse-by-verse -verse Bible study. It's year-long. This year, um, we're studying the Gospel of John all year, verse-by-verse. -verse. So we'll be, you know, Jesus quotes so many of the prophets. So go to Kelly's thing on that Monday and then come and study about the prophecies that are fulfilled that Jesus talks about in John. Um, it's a woman's study. It's going to meet on Tuesday evenings at 630. There's like a million things I want to say about it right now. But um, the two most important things is that this is, Ben and I have been involved in this Bible study since Clarabelle was a baby. And it, it has just grounded us. It's gotten us closer to each other, to God. Um, if it, it helps you understand the Bible more. It helps you be more confident in reading the Bible and trusting the Holy Spirit. Um, and it doesn't matter if you just got saved or you aren't saved, or if you've been an ordained minister, even Kelly could, you know, get something out of this. Um, anyways, I've just seen a lot of 
every time people just get closer to God and more comfortable with the word, and then they go back to their church and they serve and they serve well. So it is, that being said, the other thing is it's an outside ministry, so there's going to be women from all the churches in Bend here, which is something that's really cool to see, and I love our family church, but it's really great to see other women from other churches loving God and loving each other. So if you have any questions about that, I'll be around today and we can talk and sign up if you're interested. Okay, I think that's all. Thanks. Okay, all right. Uh, We got one more announcement here. Uh, Mr. Scora is gonna come up, talk to us about a concert going on tonight, right Dave? Yeah, it's gonna be fun. Not here. No, 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 it won't be here. Guys, it won't be here. Um, It's actually tonight at six. It's gonna be at the Fellowship uh, at Bend off of Butler. I'm just reading this right now. Bring a lawn chair if you want to. And um, there's gonna be two Grammy winning artists, both Mac Powell, I say it really fast, Mac Powell, and then Brandon Heath is also gonna be there. It's uh, supporting the pregnancy resource centers that we also do, the baby bottle drives. Um, So that is going to uh, them, and it's just going to be an awesome time to fellowship, worship. It's going to be great. If you don't have anything to do at 6, or if you do have something to do at 6, maybe you can plan around it. It's going to be awesome. Uh, We'd love to see you guys there, and um, yeah, I think that's all for me. Ben, here you go. All right. Thanks, Dave. And yeah, that is a free concert. You don't need to pay to go. So, Uh, All right, so we're going to call Pastor Matt up here. I'm going to pray for him real quick, and uh, we'll let him run away with it. All right, Lord, uh, we're so thankful for being able to gather here today. We're thankful for all the all the souls that are here, Lord, and um, we pray that uh, you'd, you'd uh, help us, Lord, to get closer to you. We'd help, uh, pray you'd help us to learn from your word today, um, get closer to each other, and just build that unity of our, our uh, church body, Lord. And we're so thankful for Pastor Matt, and um, we pray you'd bless him and give him confidence to speak the word today. In, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Ben. Hey, welcome to Compass this morning. Whether it's your first time here, your second time here, or you've been coming to church here for decades and we can't get rid of you, we're excited that you're here. (laughs) Um, But we're honored to have you join us this morning. This morning is the penultimate Sunday for our annual outdoor baptism service that you just heard our associate pastor, Kelly Jones, talk about. Now, I bet you're thinking one of two things. Which one was Kelly Jones and... What the heck does penultimate mean? First, Kelly's the funny guy that was up here with the hair that makes him look wise, which of course he is. But speaking of Kelly and his wisdom, if you were here last week, you heard a great sermon about the dinner with Simon the Pharisee. It was an awesome, awesome sermon. If you weren't here, check it out. It's worth your watching online, either at our YouTube page or or our app or our website. But it's definitely worth a watch if you weren't able to be here. So thank you for teaching us last week, Kelly. Uh, I was impacted by it. Uh, Second, penultimate is just a really fancy sounding word that simply means second to last. That's all it means. It's, oh, uh, or right before. Um, And it's used a lot in track and field, which is why I know it. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't know it. Um, But it's used a lot in long jump, triple jump, or javelin. And really what it refers to is the second to last step before you take off. And any long jumper that's worth his weight in, in jumping uh, knows that your second to last step should be a little bit longer to lower your hips for takeoff into the air for long jump. So penultimate just means the second to last. And for us, it means the second to last Sunday before our baptism Sunday. But don't worry, unlike the penultimate step used in track and field, I don't plan on lengthening this sermon today. I have no intention of doing that. I simply want to set the stage, so to speak, for the celebration that we'll have next week. Now you may remember, amen, not lengthening it. You may remember the past couple of baptism Sundays where on the Sunday of baptism we talk about baptism. Well this year I want to do something different. This year I've decided to speak about baptism on the penultimate Sunday of baptism. I'm using that word as much as possible just because I like the sound of it. But on the Sunday before the baptism I'm going to teach about baptism. That way we can begin a series next week called All In on Baptism Sunday, which is kind of a play on words because baptism means all in or immersed. So next week we're going to start a new series called All In. We're going to not be here, but we're going to be at 
the, the Cadwell's Lake, and we're going to have service out there. We're going to have music out there. We'll live stream it for those that are, that are, that are not able to be there. We'll still live stream it. Um, but you want to be out there. It's going to be a great time of, of musical fellowship and worship and teaching, and, then, and then, then we're going to dunk some people. It's going to be great. So I know that change is hard, but I've also noticed that people have poor memories. Maybe if I didn't tell you that last year on Baptism Sunday we taught about baptisms, you might not have remembered but I brought it up, and I brought it up because, well, you're not supposed to tell people that change is coming. You're supposed to do it. That's what they say. Um, but I didn't, I didn't want to get you there unprepared. And while I'm doing things I probably shouldn't do, I might as well point out another thing that pastors ought not do. Pastors are not supposed to name their sermons, or sorry, they are supposed to name their sermons something clever that sticks with people when they walk out of the church. Like last week, Kelly named his sermon, instead of Dinner with Simon the Pharisee, He called it, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, which stuck with people, I think, because it's also the title of a movie that many of us have seen. So instead of having a catchy title, I'm just going to name today's sermon Ephesians (laughs) 4-5. Actually, I'm going to name it, I'm going to title it with what the verse says itself. And my hope is when you leave here today, you'll have that whole verse memorized. You'll leave here and you'll have that entire verse committed to memory. Because as Deuteronomy eleven eighteen 18 says, it tells us to lay up God's words in our heart and soul. And so that's what we're trying to do. Jesus also tells us in John 15, 7, which you'll get to, I'm assuming, probably around October of the BSF study, <laughs> that the words of his should abide in us. Jesus' words should abide in us. So my hope is that, that when you leave here today, you'll know the words of Ephesians 4, 5. They will abide in you from this moment forward. You will have it memorized. Now, it's not the shortest verse in the Bible, but it's not nearly the longest either. Are you ready for it? You have your pens or thumbs ready, depending on how you're taking notes? Because here it comes. Here's the title of today's sermon. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. That's the whole verse. One Lord, one faith, one one baptism. Now, it's six words, but it's really only four words because the word one is used three times. So you really have to remember four words. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. In that order. Now, before I dive into this verse, I want to talk a little bit about the background of this verse in Ephesians 4-5. First, where this verse is found. Now, Ephesians is a letter written by the apostle Paul to the church in Ephesus, and the people who lived in Ephesus were called Ephesians, kind of like we, we are called Bendites because we live in Bend, or Ergonians because we live in Oregon. I won't tell you what people from Massachusetts are called. You can look it up. But <laughs> Compass studied the book of Ephesians a few summers ago in a series called Unity. And the book of Ephesians is all about unity within the brethren. So if you want to hear more about this entire letter, you can go watch that series. It is also on our YouTube channel. But today, but for today, we'll just say that the church in Ephesus, eventually pastored by a young man named Timothy, for which we also have two letters in the Bible, we're trying to figure out how this whole Christian thing worked. How can I be united with people, even though they've come to faith in the same Lord that I have, how can I be united with people that I've been enemies with my entire life? And Paul writes a letter about it. And the fifth verse of this fourth chapter comes right in a section subtitled, Unity in the Body of Christ. That's what the, that's what the subtitle is. So if you open up your Bible, you'd see that there's, there's verse numbers there, there's chapter numbers there, there's sometimes subtitles there. Those weren't originally there. The letter of Ephesians was, was just that. It was a letter written in letter form. Eventually, scholars came in and they put the chapters in and they put in the verse numbers just so we can navigate this large book, this large reading much easier. That's what they did. So in this subsection, if you were to read this, even without the verse numbers, even without chapter numbers, even without the subtitle, if you looked at that section and read it and said, what's it about? You would probably come away saying, it's about the unity in the church or the body of Christ. You'd come away with that understanding. That's why it has that subtitle. Now, regardless of people's backgrounds or ethnicity or or sex or any other distinguishing characteristic, the point of the passage is we are brought together as one through what Christ did and our faith and belief in him. In other words, the greatest characteristic of any Ephesian, or Bendite for that matter, is that we follow Christ. 
That is our greatest characteristic as believers. Now, we can be characterized in a number of different ways, but the greatest characteristic of us, the one that brings us together as one, is that we follow Jesus of Nazareth. Another way to put it, and this will resonate in our culture, is that if we were to ask how we identify, we should say we identify as Christian. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. They say that sermons ought to have three points that align with one objective. Now, I don't always do that. Sometimes I have less, and sometimes I have more. They say if you have too little, people won't get enough, and if you have too many, they won't keep enough. Whatever. The typical sermon has three points. That's what, that's what they tell you to do. Now, I don't think that's necessarily always the case. I mean, the most famous sermon in the world was the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew 5 to Matthew 7. It's like seven pages long with the tiniest font. Jesus made at least eight points there. And if Jesus makes eight points, I can make eight points. But this morning, I only have three. So, the one thing about using this sermon as the title, or this passage as the title of the sermon, is that it has outlined three points for us. And those three points, you guessed it, are the same three non-one words in this verse. Lord, faith, baptism. And we have one of them. So, let's hop in. We're going to start, and we're going to go in order with our Lord. One Lord. One Lord. That's it. There's one Lord. I've said this before, and I'll say it again, and if there's one thing that I want people to remember of any of my preaching all the time, it might be this. It is easy to call Jesus God. It is challenging to call him Lord. It's easy to call Jesus God. It's difficult to call him Lord. Calling Jesus God is easy because it is logically supported by the facts in and outside the Bible. Yes, I believe the Bible is fully true. I believe that the Bible is inerrant in its original form. I believe this because it helps make sense of this crazy world that we live in way better than any other worldview that exists. I believe that. But I also believe it because many of the events and teachings found in the New Testament are referenced by people who were not even followers of Jesus Christ. That adds to its validity. It adds to its, it, 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 uh, it, it's, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't have it written down. I didn't put it down here. Uh, it's reliability. There we go. Thank you whoever didn't tell me that. Okay, so <laughs> just let me struggle up here with that word. So it, it, it supports its reliability. Now, even the idea of the crucifixion and the resurrection are found in extra biblical texts. Extra biblical te texts just mean things that were written that aren't included in our Bible. That's all it means. So the idea of the crucifixion and the resurrection are found in writings outside of what we think of as scripture. Two of the most famous non-Christian writers were a Jewish historian named Josephus and a Roman scholar named Tacitus. Now you can look them up, they're, they're, they're great references for what happened in the early days of the church. But even if people that aren't followers of Jesus claim that he predicted his own death on a cross, as well as being raised from the dead, and evidence seems to support that, we can be reassured that those events actually happened. There's support for it. Now that brings us to, to whether Jesus is Lord or not, and what that means. After all, if a guy can predict his own death and resurrection, I think it's easy to call him God. I mean, duh. But calling him Lord is an extra step. I mean, what do I mean? Here, here's what I mean. I mean, to call Jesus Lord, you have to submit your whole life to him. Every aspect, every part, every area, you have to hand over control to this man, this God, who is fully man, fully God, you have to hand over all your life and all your activities, and, and that's a challenge. I mean, let's be honest, it's a challenge even for the most mature of Christians to hand everything over. Even years after following, deciding to follow Christ, I still think it's a challenge to hand over every aspect of my life. It's, it's, it's hard. You have to wake up every morning and decide to do it. I mean, in the area of school or work, depending on where you are in your life. I, have to, I, I go to work and school, so I have both. But sometimes I often think, don't worry, Jesus, I got this. And then every stinking time, I realize after the fact, I should have given him control. It was better that way. Every time. In the area of relationships, 
friends, co-workers, neighbors, classmates, even your spouse. I often think to myself, don't worry, Jesus, I got this. And then every stinking time, I realize that it was better to give him control in the first place. Everything's easy to see in hindsight, isn't it? Even the area of church, you know, the, the house of the Lord, Jesus' house. I often think to myself, don't worry, Jesus, I got this. And then after the fact, I come to the realization that, you know what? I should have given him control. Things are always easier for a follower of Christ. Actually, they're easier for everybody, but followers of Christ should realize it. It's easier when you give control to Jesus from the get-go. Trust me, I've been there. In the days that Jesus walked the earth, the title Lord was a title given to people who had authority or they were controlling over something. We still have remnants of this in our culture today. A popular word that uses Lord in it is the word landlord. It's someone who owns property that others might live in. Now this person controls the property and is supposed to take care of that property and the people living in it. Landlord. You're, you're overseeing this and you're taking care of it. But the word Lord took on a bigger, more global meaning after Jesus was resurrected. It took on a totally or a more full meaning. It all began when one of the disciples, who didn't quite believe that Jesus was resurrected because he didn't see it with his own eyes, came face to face with the resurrected Jesus. And listen, I can understand where he's coming from. His name was Thomas. They nicknamed him Doubting Thomas. He had the nickname the twin before, but then when he started doubting, they said, you're no longer the twin, you're Doubting Thomas, which is a rough name. But I can understand why if he didn't see the resurrected Jesus, he might not believe his buddies who say he rose from the dead. They, they might have just thought, you know what, you're, you're just yanking my chain. You're just giving me a hard time. So he wouldn't believe it. And Thomas, in this, in this passage we're going to look at here, it's, it's John chapter 20, which after the one we just looked at, you'll probably look at in end of November, I assume, in, in that BSF study that you're all going to sign up for. But it's almost at the very end of the gospel, in John 20, verse 24. I'd love you to read along with it. So now Thomas, one of the twelve called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. This is after the resurrection. Verse 25, so the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord, but he said to them, unless I see in his hands the marks of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand onto his side, I will never believe. Think about that for a second. I need to see to believe. It doesn't seem like that great of a, of a stretch of, of logic, right? I'm not going to believe it till I see it. Verse 26, Eight days later, so not right away, more than a week afterwards, eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Now I would freak out. The doors are locked and all of a sudden Jesus is there. How'd you get in here? Verse 27, then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve but believe. Verse 28, Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to Thomas, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. What a powerful passage here. Isn't it interesting though that Thomas, when he, when he comes face to face with the risen, the resurrected Jesus, the first thing he says is, my Lord and my God. Isn't it interesting that Lord comes first? I think because he realized it's easy to call him God. It's challenging to call him Lord. When Jesus makes the state, this statement that he is the way, the truth, and the life in John 14, he is declaring that not only am I God, I am the Lord. That's, what he's, that's part of what he's saying. There is no other way to get to the Father in heaven except through Jesus. That's important for us to really understand. Now that brings us to a very unpopular thought in our culture. The exclusivity of Jesus and the exclusivity of Christianity. 
When Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, there is no other way to heaven or God the Father except through me, what he's saying, there is only one way. I didn't say it. I'm just repeating what Jesus said. I just believe him. He's saying there is no other way to heaven. There aren't multiple ways to heaven. This is significant and should drive every Christian, everyone who believes in Jesus as Lord and God, it should drive us to evangelism. It should drive us to share with people that there is only one way, and we love you enough to tell you that. Now, you might hear things come back at you like bigot or closed-minded, but the most loving thing a follower of Christ can do is share the truth of who Jesus is. And like a gardener, we ought to be spreading seeds everywhere we go. Kelly talked about that a couple, year, a couple weeks ago. The idea was reinforced this past Friday to confidence that, that me, Kelly, and a couple other people were fortunate to go to. At this conference, the keynote speaker, Greg Kokel, said, although we may get opportunities to harvest here and there, much of our time is gardening. After all, before every harvest, there must be a time of gardening. Let me, let me translate that a little bit for you. Don't feel pressured to seal the deal. Don't feel pressured to make someone pray the prayer. Just be faithful to the words that God gives you when you're talking to people. You might spread seeds. You might not harvest those seeds. You might harvest other people's seeds. Just be faithful to the truth of God and share it. There was a recent survey conducted that showed that 66% of Americans that claim to be Christian believe there are, quote-unquote, many paths to heaven. 66. Two-thirds of Americans who call themselves Christians, who claim to follow Jesus, completely discard his very words in John 14. When, when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, there is no other way to heaven, two-thirds of American Christians say, I don't believe you. I don't believe the very words of Jesus. Now, I understand the desire not to ruffle feathers, not to make people feel bad, or to point out that they are sinners in need of a Savior. But it's not just them, it's us too. We are sinners, and we are in need of a Savior. We just come to the point where we've put our trust in Jesus, and that's what allows us to get there. We rely on the work of Jesus Christ. But I get it. It's hard to talk to people about this. It's intimidating. You're not sure what, what to say all the time. You're not sure, well, what if they ask me questions? You know, sometimes the best answer is, I don't know. Let's figure it out. Let's find someone who might know this answer. Let's explore this together. But it doesn't change the relationship that the most loving thing you can do is let them know about Jesus. It doesn't change that fact. People may get mad at you. They may call you names. Your relationship may change. I hope not. But it's possible. But here's the truth. I've never met anybody who's come to faith in Jesus that was mad at the person that told them about Jesus. I want you to think about that for a second. A person that comes to faith isn't mad at the person. Why did you tell me I could be saved? I'm so upset with you. That never happens. So be confident and share with love. You can share the truth with love. Those two things can go together. But the question that a Christian must work through is this. If Jesus is correct and these words are his words, if there is no other way to heaven except through him, is it more loving to not tell someone this or to actually state the truth? If someone was standing in the middle of the street and a car was coming, would you tell them to move? It's very similar. We have one Lord. There's only one way there. We need to lovingly tell people that that's the truth. They may accept it, they may not. That's not our job. It's not our job to help them accept it. It's our job to proclaim it. That's one Lord. The second part is one faith. Now, if we're honest, faith is a funny word. It's sometimes misused. It's sometimes misunderstood. It's challenging to define. It often is difficult for people to understand. I mean, explaining faith is hard. Faith is and always has been the only means of salvation. I sometimes get asked the question, if Jesus is the only way to heaven, 
What about all those people that lived before he did? It's a valid question. I get it. I used to ask a similar question. And like all questions that deserve answers, the answer is found in the Bible. Check this out. It's, it's weird how that works, isn't it? But Genesis 15.6, I'm going to read the NLT version. The, Genesis 15.6 says, And Abram, who would become Abraham, and Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. Counted him as righteous. You know how we're counted as righteous? We believe and follow Christ. Abraham, centuries before Jesus, was counted as righteous because of his faith. He was given a covenant by God. And a covenant is just simply an agreed upon commitment that he would be counted as righteous because of his faith in the Lord's word. But that's not the only place in the Old Testament we see things like this. Check out this other Old Testament verse in the book of Habakkuk. Now, or Habakkuk, depending on how you pronounce it. But this is such an underappreciated book of the Old Testament. It's a great book. I would, I would encourage you to read it if you haven't read it before. But we see again that life comes through faith. Check this out in chapter 2, verse 4. Behold, his soul is puffed up. The proud person's soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him. But the righteous shall live by faith. Now that word live doesn't just mean in the here and now. It means extending into eternity. Another translation puts it, live by their faithfulness in God. They will live by their faithfulness in God. So if you have faith in God, your faith is what gives you salvation. In the New Testament, one of the most famous verses is found in the same letter that holds our title to this sermon today. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, the letter of Ephesians, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not by your own doing. It is a gift from God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Again, You've been saved by grace through faith. Through faith. So what is faith? Well, Hebrews describes it this way in Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the insurance, assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. In Hebrews 11, it's one single chapter of, of the Bible. We don't quite know who wrote the book of Hebrews. There's all kinds of theories out there. But in this chapter alone, the, the word faith is used 29 times in one chapter. That's why this is called the chapter of faith. 29 times the word faith is used in this single chapter. And if you want to better understand the word faith and what it looks like in the life of, of a believer, Old Testament and New, read that chapter after you're done reading Habakkuk. Study it. Simply put, faith is putting your full trust into the God of the universe into the completed work of Jesus Christ. That's what it is. It's putting your full trust into it. Faith is also a lens through which the Christian views the world. That's why we call it a Christian worldview. Because it's the lens through which we see and figure out how this world works. Instead of seeing this world as, there, as this is all there is, all there was and ever will be, a la Carl Sagan or Neil deGrasse Tyson, we begin to see an eternal essence of God in this world. And that life is so much more than just what we experience physically. That's faith. That's the lens we get when we have faith. So one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Now, this last part is the baptism talk. And I want to I open and spill the can of worms from the start. Paul says that there's only one baptism, and that's a word, one baptism. But the New Testament refers to different types of baptism. Isn't that a contradiction? And the answer is no, it's not, and I'll explain it. It's not a contradiction. The two types of baptisms found in the New Testament is a physical baptism and a spiritual baptism, and both fund, fall under this one baptism. They both fall under it. But before we talk about the physical baptism and the spiritual baptism, I want to talk about the word baptism first, because the word's important. Whenever, whenever the word baptize or baptism is found in the New Testament, it comes from the word bapto or baptizo. That's, that's the word used, the Greek word used. 
Now, originally, these words were used when dyeing fabric. That's when these words were originally used. It means to immerse or dunk fully so the dye gets all of the fabric. You put the dye all the way, you put the fabric all the way under the water with the dye in it so it dyes the entire piece of fabric. So submerge or dunk. That's what, that's what this was used for originally. And when this was translated, the word bapto or baptizo, it was translated into English, but they had no word that really represented baptizo. So they made one up. So it wasn't translated, it was transliterated. In other words, they created a word in English to represent what they saw there. And that word is baptism. I kind of wish they just used the word dunk <laughs> or immerse. It would have been a lot easier for people to understand. But actually, people who performed baptisms in the early church, they weren't called baptizers. You know what they were called? Dunkers. They, they were literally called dunkers. So you'd go to a dunker to get dunked. Now all the basketball fans are psyched. But when we kind of jokingly say, we want to dunk you, we're not making a joke. We're actually being more faithful to the original writings. We say we want to dunk you. So the original text talked about dunking, full immersion into water, representing what happened to your spirit in a physical way. We'll talk more about that. But let's talk about these two types of baptisms and how they are related. The first is spiritual baptism, baptized by the Spirit. When John the Baptist came on the scene, he was dunking people in water. He was telling them to repent for their sins and turn back to God. And then he said, there's one that's coming after me that won't baptize just with water, but baptize in the Spirit as well. So those two come together in Jesus Christ. Now, when you have a spiritual baptism, this is the entire work of the Holy Spirit. We have nothing to do with it. Our spirit is brought from death to life. And it's God that does it. It's the Holy Spirit that does it. And it happens the instant a person chooses to follow Jesus. You may have had it hurt. You may have heard it said that believers have received the Holy Spirit or they are filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has filled someone's heart. This is the idea of spiritual baptism. It's now your spirit was dead and empty, but now it's full with the Holy Spirit and alive. That's what it is. In other words, when a person comes to faith in Jesus, when they put their full trust in him, his or her soul that was fully dead is now fully immersed in life. In a very real way, your soul has been dyed like fabric, so it now is dyed with Jesus. Dyed, D-Y-E-D, just for clarification's sake. And it's entirely the work of the Holy Spirit. Now when this happens, there is a desire and a command to do physical baptism, sometimes referred to as water baptism or believer baptism. It is a command to be fulfilled by those who follow Jesus. It's the physical representation of what a spiritual baptism does to your soul and what has already happened to the Christian. As you will see in the, in the story that we'll close with in the early church, people believed and then were baptized. They believed and were baptized. This is actually why Compass does not do infant or baby baptisms because it simply is not found in the Bible. In the Bible, people come to believe in Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and then that person has expressed their belief to represent that in a physical way. That's believer baptism. This is why we have lots of people who get baptized whose parents had them baptized as a baby. Because when they were baptized as a baby, usually by sprinkling water on the child, they hadn't made the choice on their own to follow Jesus yet. So those people that were baptized by their parents or by a church with sprinkling of water, eventually make the choice on their own to be a committed disciple of Jesus Christ, and they want to show the world the choice they made. That's believer baptism. Now, it's important for me to say that if you were ba baptized as a baby or, or if, you, if, if you had your child baptized as a baby, you are not a heretic. That's not what I'm saying. Please, please don't think... Matt's saying, I'm, I'm evil for having my child baptized. We, we do something similar to infant baptism. We just call it child dedication. And child dedication just says, here's my child, and I agree to raise this child in the ways of the Bible and Jesus Christ, and I want you all to help me do it. That's pretty much the same thing. 
I just want to make sure that people understand the difference between a baby baptism that's sprinkled and a believer baptism that is immersed. The immersion or dunked version of believer baptism is what's found in the Bible. But it's not a salvation issue. Baptism is not a salvation issue. It's important that we know that too. In other words, it is not true that a person must be baptized to gain eternal life. If that were the case, then the thief on the cross wouldn't have been in paradise with Jesus later that day. That's important to understand. It's a very unbiblical concept that some have promoted that you must be baptized to be saved. However, it is a command. And as followers of Jesus, we should fulfill that command. Jesus commands his disciples to go and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's a commandment. And if we truly follow Jesus because we truly have made him Lord of our life, then we should obey that commandment. And I believe that although it's not a part of salvation, it is a commandment that every Christian should take seriously. And it's important that we show the world who we are, unapologetically, without shame. So if you haven't been baptized or you haven't been dunked as a believer, I'd encourage you to hear and adhere to Jesus' command to get dunked. Fill out one of those connection cards, shoot us an email. We would like to make sure that we can walk alongside you in fulfilling this command. And it just so happens that next weekend is our annual baptism Sunday, so that could work out. Just take one of those cards or go to the website and let us know. We'd be excited to celebrate with you. And that's what it is. It is a celebration. Being baptized is a celebration. <clears throat> and if you have been baptized as a believer, come take part in that celebration. As we'll close in a moment, we'll see that it is a reason to rejoice because it illustrates the old self being totally covered by the new creation that God has made through his son. I want to close with this story. <clears throat> I want to close with a story found in the book of Acts, chapter 8. And you can read along with me if you want, or you can just sit back and enjoy the story time. Either way, check this out. In Acts, chapter 8, beginning at verse 26, it says this. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Philip's one of the disciples, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and he went. Stop for a second. I don't want you to miss this fact. An angel of the Lord told Philip to rise and go toward the south. Philip didn't ask why. He didn't complain. He didn't say maybe tomorrow. Verse 27 begins with, he rose and went. He was obedient. When God calls you to something, it could, could be an angel that tells you, it could be a feeling you get, it could be something you read in the Bible. When God calls you to do something, be obedient. Do it, just like Philip did. Continuing in verse 27. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopian, Ethiopians, who was in charge of all of her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah, verse 29. And the Spirit said to Philip, go over and join his chariot. Have you ever had that feeling when you saw someone and you thought, I should really go over and talk to that person? And then you thought, nah. That could very well be the Spirit telling you, go over and talk to that person. Be like Philip. When you get that feeling, respond. Verse 30. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? He just asked him, I see you're reading Old Testament scroll of Isaiah. Do you understand it? And this, this is why it's so important for us to read and study the Bible. So that when an opportunity comes where you can explain something to someone who doesn't yet know, you're confident and able to do it. doesn't mean you have to know every answer. But you should know a, enough about the Bible so you can answer someone's fundamental questions. Verse 31. And he said, the Ethiopian eunuch, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him in the chariot. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb, before its shearing is silent, so he opens not his mouth. 
In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life was taken away, taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? So then Philip opened up his mouth and began with this, this scripture and told him the good news of Jesus. He, he related this story to who Jesus is, because this story is talking about Jesus. And Philip was knowledgeable enough to understand that. And this next part tells me that the eunuch understood everything that Philip explained. He, he got it. He not only heard Philip say it, but he understood it. And here's what it says, verse 36. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down to the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And let me rephrase that. He dunked him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. Now there's a couple of parts of this last verse I want to talk about real quick before we leave. He went on his way rejoicing. Why do we call our baptism service a celebration? This is part of the reason why. We should be psyched that people are getting baptized. We should be psyched and, and, and excited and celebrate and rejoice when people choose to make the choice. People choose to display. There we go. That's a better way to say it. Choose to display the choice they made in Jesus Christ. That's why. Now, the other part is the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. Now, I don't know what that's about. I, I have no, sometimes I pray to, pray to the Lord, hey, Lord, why can't I be like Philip? Transport me somewhere south, especially during the winter. God says no. But it's important because a lot of times God won't call us where we want to go. He'll call us where we need to go. And that's important. It's important to understand that difference. He went on his way rejoicing. And that's why next Sunday will be a celebration. We rejoice because people have come to an internal, life-saving knowledge of who Jesus is. So I hope you'll join us next Sunday. I hope you'll bring friends. I hope you'll celebrate with us. But before I close in prayer, I want to be transparent about what I hope you walk out with this morning. I want you to walk out with this verse memorized. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. And if you're a person that has chosen to follow Jesus, but you haven't been physically baptized yet by immersion in water, I hope you heed Jesus' commandment and join us next Sunday and get dunked. I want to celebrate with you. And if you're a believer who has been baptized, I hope you better understand what baptism is and why it's so important for us to fulfill the great commission of making disciples and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I hope that we leave here today not with Thomas's nickname, but with Philip's nickname. You know what they called Philip? The Evangelist. Philip the Evangelist. Let's pray. <clears throat> God, I thank you for giving us a command to be dunked totally underwater, to represent that the old is gone and the new has come. That we are totally washed clean of our sin, not by our own doing, but by your doing. By what you accomplished by going to the cross and on the third day being raised. Defeating death for us. It was something we couldn't do. Lord, I pray that <clears throat> as we understand this, we understand how fallen we were. And many still are. And we aren't perfect. We're not sinless when we come to faith in you, but we understand what sin does. It separates us from a holy and loving God that wants nothing more than for us to turn to him. And so, Lord, I pray when when people think about this, they understand that faith in you is turning to you, trusting you, trying to live their life like you. And although we will fail here and there, we will continue to sin, as we repent, you are faithful and you'll forgive us. And that our soul that was once dead is now alive. We get to spend eternity with not only the creator of the universe, but the one that is love. 
So Lord, I thank you for that. And Lord, if there's anyone here who's moved by that information, that fact, that you are the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through you, they will make that choice today and receive that spiritual baptism to walk through life with the Spirit and then represent that with water baptism. God, we love you and we're so thankful we get to be here and worship you. In your name we pray, amen. Well, today Matt talked about believers' baptism, and I'm going to speak just for a second about believers' communion. So we had two ordinances that we are left for the church to do. One would be, is to be baptized, and the other one is, uh, and baptism is for believers. You believe and then you're baptized. It represents, you know, dying with Christ, being buried with him, and being resurrected. But then there's communion, which is also for believers, and communion is important because Jesus said, hey, I want you to do one thing to remember me, and that is fellowship around the Lord's table, which we call communion. And communion is very simple. We have a bowl of juice, which represents his blood, and we have some bread that represents his body. And we partake of that by basically just grabbing one and dipping it in there and then t partaking it. And by doing that, we're basically saying, I believe, Jesus, that when you died on the cross... You shed your blood for me. And you took your body and you gave up your body for me. And Jesus said this. He said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he said, this is, my, uh, this is the covenant. This cup is the covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So the bread rep represents his body and the cup represents his blood that was shed for us. And when we do that, he says, I want you just to remember me. What do we remember? Remember that he gave up his life for us. He took our place when he died on the cross. He just said, I want you to remember that whenever you do it. Didn't say do it once a month. That's what we do. Some churches do it once a year. Some churches do it every week. And none of them are right or wrong. But whenever we do it, we just remember him. So we're going to remember him today. So how we're going to do it this morning is the Bible says that a man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. In other words, we need to take, take a moment and bow our head, close our eyes, focus on our relationship with him. And if there's something in our life that basically is wrong against him, something that we have not confessed to him, we just make that right with him. That's all he's saying. Just take a moment and think about your relationship with him. Then after you do that, he says, then partake of the bread and drink of the cup. And we have three stations, one here, one in the back on the right, and then on the back on the left, we have a station that has a gluten-free cracker that you can take if you're gluten intolerant for those people so that we can all participate together. If you're visiting with us today, you don't need to be a member of our church. I say this every time. We don't have church membership, so you can't do that. But you are a member of God's family if you know Jesus. And if you know him, then by his invitation, he says, hey, remember me and remember him today. So f please feel free to do that. So I'm going to pray. And as I'm praying, you pray. Take a time to do that. And then when you feel led, just get up from where you are seated. Go and grab the, the bread and the juice and partake. And remember what Jesus did for you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we um, come to you just in great need. Your grace is overwhelming to us that you loved us that much. And Father God, we, in your great plan of redemption, don't have any understanding of how you could love us so much you would give your son for us. We remember what you did for us, how much you loved us. Jesus, we remember how you suffered for us how you paid the penalty for us. And we are so grateful and are so thankful that you did for us what we can never do for ourselves. So we come humbly before you today. 
We're so thankful for forgiveness of sin. Not only sin that we've done in the past, but sins we will do in the future. We're so thankful for that. We just pray, Lord, today that if there's any sins that we have a church have done, we lift them up to you and ask that you would forgive us of those things and point those things out to us, Lord, so that we can make them right with people if somehow we've offended people or caused them to stumble. So we ask your forgiveness as a church family this morning. And we're so grateful that you forgive us of all our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Guide us this morning as we remember you. In your son's precious name, Jesus. Amen. speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Cause your name is power Your name Speak the holy name, Jesus. 
is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We just praise you. Thank you, Lord. Are you guys ready to go out on one fast, fun one? I want to see some dancing today, okay? Let's go. Oh, yeah. Let's go side to side. No, <laughs> Take a liking to you, and I hope you have a wonderful, blessed day.